morning. Rainy day. It's typical. Just as I need to get my pilot's license signed off and uh, get the plane in for its MOT. The, um, you know, it just stops raining non-stop and blowing a hooli. So, how are you? All right? Good, good. We just uh, heard a couple of days ago that we're gonna go into national lockdown in England again from November the 5th, Thursday. Monday the 2nd today and uh, you know, one of the big questions was are the dentists are going to be shut are they going to be shut and uh, which was a question I didn't really hear asked when we went into the first national lockdown nobody really uh, sort of realised that they might miss dentists you know everybody's uh, there's this funny thing about dentists where whenever I was interviewed on the radio uh you would sort of get, um, they would sort of question, question you uh, in the first 30 seconds, the first minute of the interview was really just taking the piss out of dentists because it was like, oh great, we've got a dentist on the show, you know, that, that's going to be good for a few laughs. Let's get all our uh, anti-dentist feeling out and all our anti-dentist jokes out and, uh, and then they're sort of, uh, They'll give you like quite a hard time about what you know. Surely dentists are all millionaires, and why is the NHS dental service collapsing? But, you know, it must be because of the greedy dentists. And then the last 30 seconds, they would sort of say, "Well, you know, but you know, you know what, what is your case? You know, what is <laughs> in the interest of balance?" <laughs> Let's give you a chance just to have a, a little bit of sympathetic questioning right at the end. But um, dentistry's. Uh, emerged as, as one of these services that people really uh, have decided that they're having a lot of trouble doing without. And there's a massive backlog. I mean, talk about the backlog that built up to 1948 to the creation of the health service. We're getting a similar backlog building up uh, to the reopening of the National Health Service, assuming that it does reopen. Uh, at the moment, it's a sort of open, but it's shut, you know. Dentists are on 100% of their pre-COVID earnings for for signing a letter saying that they'll do at least 20% uh, of their pre-COVID workload and won't take advantage of the situation to go private, do a private conversion, force all their a previous NHS dentists uh, patients to come in privately. But anecdotally, the word is that. Uh, that's being observed in the breach and if you want to get anything done you're being told that you've got to come in privately and certainly um, I mean the balance of our practice has changed when I uh, started practicing we had a large number of people who came in on a regular basis by which I mean every six months now I would say the majority of people who come into the practice every day are people who are where it's their first course of treatment or the second course of treatment um, instead of uh, making people healthy and then keeping them healthy, there's very low uh, incidence of repeat disease. Um, and it's entirely because of the way we run the practice. Because we run the practice preventively, uh, we emphasize uh, the use of disclosing tablets and a simple 30p manual brush before anything else, you know, before floss, before mouthwash. Before you spend £300 on some super duper Bluetooth electric toothbrush, um, before TPs, before anything else, uh, it's all disclosing tablets and brush. And if you can't get through that, that stage, then that's where you do, you just stay at that stage and we just keep telling you, that, uh, you know, get your plaque under control. <laughs> think something's gone wrong with the gearbox. <laughs> Anyway, <clears throat> so so there's a concern now that um, you know people are, 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 are now asking the question: Will the dentist stay open? And it's one of the first questions they're asking. And of course, the British Dental Association is, says uh, we don't know. You know, we're waiting to ask whether we can stay open. We 
think we can. We think we should, but we need permission. And it's that it's that old, uh, you know, seeking permission, sort of the the, the Russian infantryman who's got a soldier, enemy soldier squarely in his sights, but then shoot him uh, because he has to pass the requisition to shoot up the chain of command. <laughs> so we are in the independent sector, the small independent sector thriving quite well at the moment because we are nimble enough to stay ahead of the virus. Whereas the, uh, the old centralized collective, the Soviet socialist style management that's running the National Health Service um, is, is not and it has to adopt a lowest common denominator type approach. You know, that even the stupidest dentist and dental nurse they think can follow. Um, talking of which, I mean, we, I got a, somebody complained about one of my YouTube videos. This is a first. For the first time ever, someone complained that uh, one of my YouTube videos identified someone by name. And you're not allowed to refer to people, uh, people's uh, name or their, their address or their telephone number or their, you know, their email address or whatever. If, they're, if these people are not in the public domain, uh, it's called doxing, which is because you're releasing their documents. And um, so I got a YouTube uh, complaint for doxing someone. And the person I docked was a bloke called Nelligan, who's uh, uh, pretty high up in the Department of Health. But he's a public figure. I mean, so, you know, and he's... And I, it's, it's, I don't even think I referred to him. I, I mean, for a start, he introduced himself when he... I was doing a comment on the Department of Health video and uh, he, uh, they introduced themselves. It was uh, Sarah, Sarah Hurley, and uh, Matt Nelligan, and uh, they introduced each other and they introduced themselves. So I think the whole thing, someone just pressed the button by mistake. Either that or it's a, uh, what are they called, a frivolous and vexatious. It might be, it may be a vexatious complaint because the Department of Health don't want my video pointing out their blatant idiocies to, to uh, remain up on YouTube. Anyway, <clears throat> that was just a, an, an aside. So, well, I'll let you know what comes of that. So, on the one side we've got the Central Soviet of the National Health Service, and then on the other side we've got the crony capitalists, which are the uh, corporates, which are led by uh, basically people who s see dentistry as a commodity and a, a way to make money and have people like the ex-chief dental officer Barry Cockcroft on the boards as uh, non-executive directors and they are hamstrung because they want NHS contracts that's their basically they, they've got a slightly more complicated proposition, which is that they want to hoover up practices, right? Their model is not a revenue model. Their model is a capital model, by which I mean they they buy 10 practices, let's say for 50 million, and then they add another 40 practices and uh, make, make it 50 practices, and they then sell that for, I don't know, 700 million or something. And then they put on another 150 practices, make it 250 practices or whatever. And then they sell it for five billion or something. And then eventually it gets sold to someone like um, Luke Johnson, who who buys it for so many billion. And then um, the idea being that the more practices, the more economies of scale there are. So for example, you only need one massive HR department. You, you only need one payroll department. Uh, you only need one purchasing department because then you know and you can buy someone like dental directory you can actually buy your own supplier ready-made 
and so you make a lot of economies of scale um, and but the thing is you don't need to run at a profit because the money you make comes when you sell uh, so what you do is you borrow like mad to uh, uh, add to buy surgeries to your group and then um, you you pay the uh, lenders back after three to five years when when you come to sell the group this is the t this is the junction of death and I've got a complete idiot oh, over there who's causing it to let me out on the main road which is very unusual yeah so what you're so, so I'm up against on the one side I'm up against uh, the central Soviet that can sort of print money and on the other side I'm up against the crony capitalists who can borrow unlimited amounts of money at zero percent and don't mind running at a loss and don't have to pay the money back or don't have to pay any interest on it and and weirdly enough against those two groups we are doing quite well because we are uh, we are uh, lean enough and mean enough to hold our own in that fight uh, we can get the PPE because I only need like 50 masks. I, I don't need, I don't need half a million masks, you know, uh, FFP3 masks or F FFP2 masks. And uh, I don't need to, if I want to make a change, I don't need to get it signed off by some faceless bureaucrat <laughs> in the Department of Health, which delays everything for a week. And uh, so we've made the decision to carry on working but I'm going to carry on and we've changed the system whereby uh, we're now charging the patients in advance for uh, their treatments and that's because uh, the hygienists can see about eight people a day hang on a second let me just get my wing mirror let me just deploy my automatic wing mirror we can uh, yeah so we see eight patients in a day and the other day she had eight, uh, six patients booked in and um, only three, uh, two of them turned up. Well, she had five, five patients booked in, and only two of them turned up. So, 60% of them cancelled. And so, and the two that turned up were at 10 o'clock and 4 o'clock. And the 9 o'clock didn't turn up, which was frustrating. 10 o'clock then turned up. And then the 11 o'clock didn't turn up, but, but by then she'd waited for them. And then she waited for the two o'clock patient who then didn't turn up, and, and by which time she could have gone to Tesco's and done some shopping or something. But you can't get in touch with these people, they, and they just don't turn up. So, um, and then she had to then wait through three o'clock for the four o'clock patient <coughs> before she could go home at five. So she'd been in there from sort of quarter to nine, half nine, quarter to nine till five o'clock to see two patients. And this is just not, you know, we decided sometimes it takes a disaster to show you that change is necessary and so we decided that uh, the change that was necessary was to charge these patients in advance and we have a very very liberal um, cancellation policy which is that providing you give us even one working day's notice we don't charge um, we only charge if you cancel or reschedule or don't turn up at less than one working day's notice and that's not we, we very very rarely flex that because um, I do strongly believe that um, it's at that point it becomes the patient's responsibility even if even if it's it's a thought that's entirely outside their control you know if their car breaks down they get hit by, by a meteorite that's fine it's at that point, the one working day beforehand, the whole risk that they can't attend transfers over onto them. And we had one, one daft plumber uh, recently who complained about the 260 quid that we were going to charge him for not turning up. And I worked out that he'd been told 11 times that if he didn't come in, he would be charged as if he had attended. Uh, and so, you know, it's... Uh, we, we, Every time someone complains about that policy, we look and we see whether we could make it any more clear 
we don't intend to vary it and the reason why we don't vary it is because uh, the problem with dental patients is that they are of every intention of coming to your appointment when they make it they have every intention of coming to your appointment when they get the reminder the week beforehand the point at which their resolve fails them is the morning of the actual appointment they wake up and you know that that sort of five seconds you go through when you wake up and you think to yourself what day is it today oh god I hope it's the weekend I hope I'm not working today you know um, and then you think oh bollocks it's a Monday or bollocks it's a Wednesday or something and then and then it's double bollocks I've got a dental appointment today and so you then get this sort of uh, I'll ring up and cancel I'll tell you, I'll ring up and cancel and of course by then they're in the window uh, which if they do cancel then they end up paying as if they'd come in anyway and once they know that they're going to pay the same whether they come in or not that tends to tip the seesaw the other way they tend to think well I will rather than pay the money and get nothing I'd rather pay the money and get the treatment and get it over and done with so it discourages non-attendance this one day window but it's not enough because if someone just simply doesn't turn up then we have no sanction the only sanction we've got is to issue them with an invoice equivalent to what they would have paid and watch while they don't pay it but but on the other hand at least they don't come back you know they don't do it to us again they don't get a chance to do it to us twice so um, but anyway we, we now the problem is you might think well a dentist that's in a community who starts blacklisting patients um, is eventually going to have some sort of impact because uh, these patients eventually will will think will run out of they'll they'll think you know I really should have had that problem fixed and I'm going to need to mend fences with my dentist and and you know and possibly pay the fine and go in and get the work done but in fact that's never the case there, there's always an infinite number of patients and an infinite number of dentists which mean that barring uh, someone from your pub doesn't stop them drinking you know they just go and drink at the next pub they have to be barred from every pub in the village and then they'll go and drink in the next village or they'll move to a village where they're not barred from any of the pubs um, and in dentistry there's no system at all for uh, there's no central notification of patients who are barred on, on the grounds of non-attendance um, and in fact if we for example if I every week sent out a list just to the local dentists of patients who had been barred for non-attendance uh, first of all it would probably be a breach of uh, GDPR and secondly uh, the, de oh, the dentist wouldn't reciprocate it's not like someone would say oh that's a good idea I'll send you mine they would just sit and have a laugh uh, and, and say oh yeah we we had her you know we had her or we had him I remember him he was a right pain when he came here as well you know um, we tend to keep quiet on the basis that uh, my uh, my enemy's enemy is my friend uh, and so if they've got a problem patient that causes problems for a problem competitor dentist then um, that, that, that's good you know so anyway, I mean, it had uh, obviously it had a massive impact on cash flow. I think uh, we took we took uh, for a large four-figure sum for us on the day that we started charging in advance, and um, because most of our patients are new, because we have we have this um, uh, how can I put it? We, you know, as I say, because the nature of the clientele has changed, in that it used to be. Uh, repeat restorative work and it's far more now patient comes in patient has like for them what is probably the most expensive course of treatment they've ever had in their lives then gets nagged about their brushing 
um, and uh, and and you know, been, and told are told to put themselves on a sugar-free diet so far as possible. I eat no cakes, biscuits, and sweets, um, which is simple. You know, all they've got to remember is no cakes, biscuits, and sweets. Disclosing tablets and a cheap brush, and that is the the recipe for dental health. You know, that is why. That is the recipe that dentistry has always failed to embrace. Um, but when it's operated properly, uh, means that you get very, very, very little repeat business. So apart from the patients who are what I call uh, insurance minded, who are in the AA and who've got boiler insurance and who want to come in on third party capitation, um, all your income is going to come from uh, new patients who are being fixed by virtue of your, the fact that you're the only dentist with any spare capacity, by virtue of the fact that you're the only dentist that's curing anybody, uh, and that's the model that I proposed several times for the National Health Service, but has never been, you know, since 1954 has, uh, has, been, has always been turned down on the basis that um, uh, it's not, uh, it, didn't, it didn't emanate from the Department of Health. That's my suspicion. But that's why that model is not, uh, you know, and also hygienists will tell you that they do prevention. You know, the hygienists are very protective of their sector, aren't they, of their vertical market. And uh, if I said to you that 90% of all the work that the hygienist does is, is pointless, you know, is, is a complete waste of time. Because uh, not, I, you know, I've never met a hygienist who ever got a patient to chew up a disclosing tablet, or used a disclosing solution on a patient's teeth, and and literally got down in the mud with them and and brushed their, showed them how to brush their teeth, and then watched them brush their teeth, and and uh, gave them gave them some disclosing tablets and a brush free to take away, and told them that they're going to have to change their brushing completely, you know. It's almost all, you know, it's always, what. oh, why are all my teeth falling out? Well, because you've never brushed your teeth properly. Oh, that can't be right. I've always been to the dentist uh, every time they've asked me to come in. I've always been to the hygienist and done what the hygienist has asked me to do. Uh, you know, I brush my teeth twice a day. What more can I do? I use expensive toothpaste. I bought a 300 pound toothbrush. I use, she told me how to use these TP things. I, I floss, you know, even though I cut my gums to shreds, I floss, uh, you know, so, so don't you tell me, don't you tell me. <laughs> the fact that all my teeth are loose and falling out is due to any failure on my part. You know, it's the profession that's let me down, not, not my own efforts, you know, and you have to deal with these patients um, all the time. Anyway, we're charging in advance, and uh, I don't know, uh, we're going to carry on as normal. Uh, we're allowed to, dentists are an essential service, patients are allowed to leave home for medical appointments, and I am not going to ask anybody for permission. Uh, I'm not a member of the BDA, and the, you know, the legal advice was that while the Chief Dental Officer can close NHS practices, she can only do it by by force, you know, she can do it by um, basically implying that if you don't do as Simon says, then you won't get a contract when it comes up for renewal. Um, not that a lot of these NHS dentists are going to want a contract, to be quite honest with you, unless it's paying them, you know, to do 100% uh, of the work for 20% of the work, which is, you know, I'd want an NHS contract under those circumstances. And so if I was after an NHS contract when you and I probably would would shut down. Especially as they're paying 80% of the furloughed staff again. But um, uh, she's got no power to shut down private practices. I think that was established pretty much by uh, my indemnifier, which is one of the minor ones. But really shit hot and totally switched on to uh, what is the legal position with regard to the power the Chief Dental Officer has over uh, over private practices, which is none, you know, none, absolutely none. So good. 
anyway, I'll, um, I'll let you know how it goes. I hope you're well, and I'll talk to you soon. Right, bye.